I guess I'd like to start with a question, and maybe I'll direct this at, at Marvin. Traditionally, when people talk about peak oil, the, the simple concept, it's, it's the mountain-shaped uh, line on a graph. There's a point at which, you know, the, the old King Hubbard curves where when you've produced about half of a field or a country's field or the world's field, you start on a decline, and it could be slower, it could be fast. That normally doesn't take into account uh, unconventional fuels, and it may or may not take into account, depending on how it's used, new technologies and higher prices. And I guess I would like to ask to what extent new technologies and higher prices will um, extend that peak, maybe turn it into a plateau, and then to what extent the limits are really geological and to what extent they're above the ground where not having access to some of these reserves or security concerns or um, inadequate contract uh, safety for uh, an investor-owned company to go in, where are the obstacles and how much can we extend that peak? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think in terms of the, the shape of the curve, if you will, it, it feels pretty clear from you know, all the energy data and systems that I look at. And it's, if you allow the, the price to stay high enough to, to make different um, reserves commercial, that it would be much more of a plateau looking curve rather than an up and down. And, and you know, we, can, we can put our fingers on enough hydrocarbons out there now to know that would be the case. Um, the question is, I think it was we, in the PICOL discussion, is could it actually increase? But certainly a plateau would be realistic over time. You mentioned something that is a daily part of my business now, and that is the, uh, the above ground risk versus the below ground risk. And I, and I think that's the, I look at it in two ways. One is there's no smooth future, no matter how you look at it. It's a, it's a volatile picture, depending on you know, when things are found, when they're developed, what's happening, happening politically. And, uh, and otherwise, and of course, there are places where, you know, we're in discussions right now with communities where, we're, you know, there are, are oil deposits or, or gas deposits, and the discussion is around should we be able to drill there and produce those. And so I, I concluded that in, in the above ground risk discussion as well. And that's, it, it, it takes up, you know, when I, when I think about all the effort we put into technology, there's, we're moving to a point where there's almost an equal effort put into the above ground risk. So it's a very real part of the, of the business and I think an important part of the debate. And it, it's, it's, the, it's part, one of the elements that's going to drive us to, to getting to, you know, whatever that right balance is in terms of continuing to develop hydrocarbons. It's, that's the discussion that's going to help us get to that, that right balance. I will just take the opportunity to say one other thing that is, uh, you know, is sort of a technology wonk myself. I mean, it, it's, it is amazing what technology can do. And, and the, the advances in technology are just stunning. And when, you know, I, th I think about the last conversation Amory and I had in terms of what that could mean for the transport sector and the dramatic changes that that could result in the <coughs> fuel requirements and what have you. Um, all the way to, you know, the idea of drilling in 10,000 feet of water and producing oil and gas, which we're doing today, it's, it's incredible technology that's associated with that. And that's not stopping. That's continuing to advance. Yeah, let me, let me just make that real. I brought along a Saudi Arabia we recently found under Detroit, uh, <clears throat> just a little test piece of some advanced composite, uh, which is tougher than titanium and can be quickly molded. So at in a mature process at scale, you could make aerospace grade ultralight structures, very light, very strong, at automotive cost and speed. There's a little spinoff we did down in Glenwood Springs. Well, if you make all your cars and light trucks out of this in the U.S., you just found a Saudi Arabia under Detroit. It's about an eight and a half million barrel a day, very prospective play. We found it drilling in the Detroit formation. And it's a whole <laughs> lot easier to find that oil than under 10,000 feet of water. Mm. Basically what happens is when you make your vehicles out of this, half the weight and half the fuel use go away. Uh, the vehicle gets safer because this stuff absorbs 12 times the crash energy of steel per pound and the car costs the same to make because the costlier materials are paid for by simpler automaking and uh, uh, smaller propulsion system. Also think of this as a carbon cap. So, <coughs> uh, the, uh, and, and there's a lot more like that. We, we have an, at, at old prices, say two odd bucks a gallon, about a two-year payback to triple the efficiency of our cars and light trucks in this country, one year to triple the efficiency of our heavy trucks, four or five-year payback to triple the efficiency of our planes, although it's now looking cheaper than that. 
this is a hell of a lot better payback than going to the ends of the earth for, to drill for very expensive oil that might not even be there. And if somebody else, meanwhile, finds all that oil under Detroit, it's kind of embarrassing. So of course we should drill the most prospective place first. And in this country, we got 20 million barrels a day of them on the demand side. So I think that's a lot easier than dealing with the above end, let alone or <laughs> below ground risks that, that uh, exercise Marvin and his colleagues. Well, let, let's come back in a minute to some of these efficiency opportunities. But I also want to talk about something that I think both of you touched on lightly. And let me direct this to you, Randy. Um, the concept of moving to unconventional oil as a replacement for or supplement for conventional oil. Obviously, there are difficulties in doing that. And I know you've been active in uh, considering some of those. Do you want to comment on the potential for and the problems of unconventional oil? So the thinking is we've used 1,000 billion barrels of this conventional oil. We might have one to 2,000 billion barrels of conventional oil left, but that we have lots of unconventional oil. Um, this unconventional oil deserves some serious contemplation, both from the climate perspective and from the cost of actually getting it out of the ground, and finally from the energy return that it offers or does not offer. There are three sources of unconventional oil. There are the tar sands in Canada, probably the most damaging single activity human beings are doing on the planet right now. Uh, we have half of the world's oil shale here in western Colorado. That's the second great source. It has one-seventh the energy content per ton uh, that uh, coal has. It has one-third the energy content per ton that you would find in Captain Crunch. Uh, the idea that we're going to develop this, Shell has spent $200 million and to produce 1,700 barrels total of uh, uh, shale oil in the last decade. At that rate, the shale oil that we have here in Colorado will last six million years. Um, this is an incredible reserves to production ratio. It's something that gives me a great optimism for the future. Uh, the, third, the third great source of unconventional oil is bitumen, uh, heavy oil in Venezuela. Now, when we talk about having our fingers on oil now, I think it's important to recognize that we no longer are in control of the oil supply gain. We may be in control partly of part of the oil demand gain, uh, given our 20 million barrels a day of consumption. But oil supply now is controlled by people like Chavez, like Putin, who has expropriated some of Shell's uh, production in Sockland Island in the last few years. Um, this is a new world. Uh, these people, um, they, they now understand that energy is the original currency. When we spend a billion dollars, when we send a billion dollars overseas each day uh, for petroleum, it's no surprise or no accident that the U.S. dollar is in the tailspin it's in right now. Uh, we're hemorrhaging the lifeblood of our civilization. That, 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 that's, the, that's the reality. And unconventional oil is very expensive to develop. New tar sands projects, 100,000 uh, dollars per incremental barrel per day. Very expensive. We're going to double that production probably from a million to two. Shell will increase their production there a little bit uh, over, you know, 100,000, 200,000 barrels a day over the next decade, perhaps. Uh, I don't think oil shale here in Colorado will ever happen. Uh, and uh, what Chavez wants to do with his heavy oil in Venezuela is up to him, not up to us anymore. <laughs> 